During these days, a few days before Rosh Hashanah, we're nervous for the upcoming Deen, but at the same time, we have to seize the opportunity of this wondrous, wondrous time called, we're at the end of the month of Elul, Ani le dodi vidodi li. I am for my beloved and my beloved is for me. What does it mean, Ani le dodi? I am for my beloved. It means everything about us is supposed to be for Hashem. Our entire existence is supposed to be for Hashem. Whatever His will is, our will should be. Ani ledodi. I am for you, Hashem. If we're going through a troubling time, if we're not getting what we want, and we feel, oh, I can't, it's so hard. Another day like this, we're supposed to say, Hashem, if this is what your will is for me now, then Ani dodi. I'm willing to do it. If this is the life you want me to live at the moment, then I will do it, I will do it with joy. Someone who lives the life of Ani dodi. Whatever my beloved wants, that's what I'm willing to do. They are a walking Kiddush Hashem. Let me explain. Imagine you have, especially somebody who has a hard time. Imagine you have a family where one of the children is going through a hard time and it looks like his father is not helping him. So someone goes to the child and they say, what kind of father do you have? He's not even helping you. You need him. This is the time you need him the most, and he's abandoning you. And then the boy says back, he says, what are you talking about? My father is the best father. He takes care of me like nobody else. He loves me. You don't understand. That would bring about a glory to the father's name, especially since it's coming from his child. We all have the kavod of Hashem, so to speak, in our hands. If somebody says, oh, it's so hard for you. How come Hashem's doing this to you? So difficult. You're such a good person. It's not right. It's not fair. You have two choices. You could say, yeah, you're right. I don't understand. It's not fair. Or you could say, what are you talking about? Hashem is so kind. Hashem does everything for me. This would bring about a Kiddush Hashem. If you could become the person who in all situations says, Ani ledodi, I am for my beloved. Whatever my beloved wants, I'm in. That is a tremendous Kiddush Hashem. How do we do that? How does someone become a person who always says, I need it because it's hard. We don't always get what we want. We thought we were going to get something. It didn't work out. We thought we we're going to get a salvation. It didn't work out. To say in that situation, if this is what you want, Hashem, I'm willing to do it. Very, very high level. How does someone reach that level? The answer is the end of the Pasuk. The Pasuk says after vedodi li. We have to know that everything about Hashem is for us. Everything, day and night, 24-7, Hashem is working for us. All He wants is our best interest. All He wants is for us to achieve our purpose. We don't understand what our purpose is he does. And if we could always remember, Dodi Li, this is for me. I don't understand why, but this is for my benefit. Then we could become Anile Dodi. Everything about our religion is all for us. Hashem is so kind. Every mitzvah that we do, we think that we're doing Hashem a favor. We think we come to shul. You know, we're helping out Hashem. Hashem, you know what I did for you today? I came to a class. I did some kindness. 
The Pasuk says all of the mitzvot are all letov lach, for your good. Everything is for you, not for him. The Pasuk says in Iov, im sidakta matiten lo. If you are the righteous, most righteous person, what are you giving him? He is all complete. He doesn't need our service. We are the ones getting paid for the mitzvot. But look how kind Hashem is. Hashem says, I know if you keep getting and getting and getting, you're going to feel it's hard to enjoy when someone keeps receiving and receiving. Hashem gives us trillions of gifts all the time. If we would think about all that we have, we would realize how much kindness He bestows upon us. But nobody likes to be a receiver all the time. So Hashem makes us feel like we're paying Him back through doing the mitzvot. And this way we could enjoy His bounty. And even through what we feel like is payback, we're also getting rewarded for that. This is the unbelievable kindness of Hashem. Imagine you have somebody who you love so much. And you want to give that person a gift. From the moment you start thinking about the gift, you become excited. I'm going to get that person a gift. The person's going to love it. And you start thinking and thinking, what could they use? And you figure it out. Oh, perfect. And you go to the store and you pick out the perfect gift. And you get it wrapped. And you're so excited to give it. By the time you're ready to give it, you have more excitement in giving than the receiver has in receiving. You know what we say about Hashem every day in the Amidah, three times a day in the Sim Shalom? Ki be'or panecha natata lanu. With a shining face, Kavi Yachol, is how you give us. Hashem is so excited to give. He's beaming. He can't wait to shower us with beracha. All he wants to do is give, and he begs us, please, baharta bahaim, choose life. I put it in front of you. The Torah is in front of you. Please, I beg you, choose correctly, because all I want to do is give you, and give you, and give you, and he's so excited to give. And when we don't follow the Torah, we're hurting ourselves, but even then, Hashem is so merciful. He gives us time to repent and more time and more time. So if we realize that Dodi is Li, if we realize that Hashem is for us, we'll be able to become Anile Dodi. If we would realize how valuable our deeds are, because we don't really know. We don't know. Nobody knows what one mitzvah is worth. Nobody knows. The Rav Chaim Vital once asked his rabbi, the Arizal, he says, you know, it says in the Torah that there's reward for this mitzvah, this mitzvah, in this world. Someone who does this gets this. Someone who does... He says, how come we see people doing the mitzvot and they're not getting that? The Arizal told him, those rewards are promised to somebody who does the mitzvah the way it's supposed to be done. How is it supposed to be done? He says with simha. If you would do a mitzvah with the joy that he says like you made a million dollars, the joy that we have when we make a lot of money, if you would have that joy when you do a mitzvah, I guarantee you every blessing will be fulfilled in that person. How do we get that joy? We have to realize what the value is. Once someone sees, we don't see it, but we talk about it. Because once someone sees the value of his deeds, he's going to wish, I wish I did more. I want more. Now, there was a famous man, we all heard of him, Oscar Schindler, who saved 1,100 Jews in the Holocaust. And when he was watching at the end, when he saw all these people that he saved, what was his reaction? They told him, look what you did. You saved 1,100 lives. He started to cry. They said, what are you crying about? 
He said, I could have saved more. I could have gotten more. It's not enough. I wasted so much money. And then they said, what do you mean? Look what you did. He says, you see that car? That car I could have got 10 more lives for. And everyone's this. You see this pin? This pin on my shirt? This is gold. They would have given me two more people for this pin. At least one. One more life. Could have gotten one more life. When someone sees the value, he says, I wish I could have had more. We don't want to wait and say and regret at the end. Now is the time we're supposed to say, Hashem, Ani Dodi, I trust you that the mitzvot are valuable. I trust you that your Torah is emed. I'm in 100%. I want everything. These are the feelings we're supposed to have at this time on coming to Rosh Hashanah. And we have to realize our potential. Some people say, I wish I could be that. It's just not me. You know, I see my friend. My friend is able to do everything. He's able to be, to learn so much Torah. And my, she's able to be so religious. But me? I don't have it in me. There's a great rabbi. There was a great rabbi, Rav Chaim Kreisworth. Av Bedin in Belgium. He told over the following story. He said at the end of the Holocaust, towards the end, he met up with a certain person who told him, Rabbi, he was young at the time, he was still studying, he said, Rabbi, I feel like I'm gonna die in the next few hours. I don't know what happened to anybody in my family. I could be the last remnant, I don't know. He said, but Rabbi, I have in a Swiss bank account millions and millions of dollars. If I die, it'll stay there forever. No one will ever know about it. I'm entrusting you. I trust you. I'm giving you the PIN number to this bank account. If you will ever find somebody from my relatives, please give him the money. The rabbi said, no problem. You could trust me. And, for thir and the man died. And for 30 years... Rav Kreisworth told nobody about this money until one day when he was the Abed Dean in Belgium. Some poor man walks in with tattered clothing and he's begging the rabbi, please help me, I need money, I'm starving. And the rabbi sat down and talked to him and he realized after a while that this man, this man was the son of that person who died, who left the money. And he slowly told him, that he's a multi-millionaire. And this man ended up living the rest of his life wealthy. And Rav Kreisworth said, I learned a very important musad from this story. He said, was this man walking around in tattered clothing, was he rich or poor all that time? He was rich. He just didn't know it. But he had all that money. It was his. He just didn't know. He says, every Jew is so rich. We have inside of us a piece of Hashem, a chelek of Elokai Mimal. Hashem blew into us a piece of Him. We could do anything. We have Hashem with us. We are so fortunate, but we don't realize it. We don't know the wealth that we have inside of us. We don't know how great we could be. And I've seen with my own eyes people who look like nothing. Someone once walked, I have a, a yeshiva program for college boys. And someone once walked into the program. He was wearing a ripped t-shirt and jeans and he walked in two hours late. We learned for two, two, three hours in the morning. He comes in, we start at 9, 10.30 he walks in. And he sits down, could I learn with you? Okay, I guess. He sits down, he starts learning with me. And I'm asking a question and he gets the answer and he's shooting back. I said, wow, this person's a gem. I said, I'll, I hope to see you tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, he didn't show up. I called him, where are you? 
Oh, I'm sorry, I was out late last night. I woke up late. The next day, the same thing. The next day, a week later, he walks in again one morning at 11 with a half hour left. And again, with learning, and he's shooting back, and he's getting the ends. He's, a, he's unbelievable. And I tried, and I tried to work with him. This boy today is learning full time. This boy is a su he's, he's he teaches, he's bringing back boys to religion. Somebody who you look at on the outside, and you say, oh, what is this guy? He doesn't know anything. But you start digging deeper, and you dig deeper, and you say, wow, he's a gem. Every single person is like that. We have so much potential. We have to just pull it out of ourselves. Some people, they feel distance from Hashem. They say, Hashem doesn't want me. I've been doing so much bad. He doesn't want to hear from me. Someone told me, I haven't prayed in months. I said, why not? Because I'm so bad. Hashem doesn't want to hear me. If you would know the love that Hashem has for you, we would never say that. No matter how much evil we have done, Hashem never abandons us. I heard a story, I think Rabbi Ephraim Waxman told it over. There was a Sadiq, great man who had a child go off the derech. The child left home and his father did all he could to keep the boy close. But the boy was just, he was just bad. And as much as the father tried to love him, the boy didn't want to hear of it. And Lo Aleno, he died in a tragic way. And by the funeral, the father was crying by the kever. He called to his son and he said, my son, Amochel you, I forgive you. He said, I forgive you, Belev Shalem, with a full and complete heart. I don't want you to suffer one bit because of what you did to me. I want you to go straight to Gan Eden. I don't want you to have any detours. I promise you, I forgive you. Because no matter how much a child pains his parent, a father's existence is his child. He'll do anything for his child. I don't want him to get hurt. I forgive him. That's just a small, small inkling. Hashem loves us a billion times more than that. He's rooting for us. He wants us to come back. No matter how far we have gone, Hashem is rotseh b'tshuva. He wants us. It says in the Navi, Lo ehpots b'mot harasha. Hashem says, I don't want the rasha to die. Ki im b'shuvo midarko v'chai. I want him to return to me and live. We say on Rosh Hashanah, we say to Hashem, we say in the tefillah, im kebanim, if we're like children, rahameno kerahem av albanim then have mercy on us like a father to his son. Im ka'avadim, but if we're like slaves, enenu lecha teluyot ad shetechonenu v'tosi la'or. If we're like slaves, then our eyes are turned towards you until you help us. And some people understand that we're not sure. Are we children or are we slaves? So we say, ah, either way. If we're children, then treat us like children. We're slaves. Could it be that the great men, the great rabbis don't know if we're considered like children or we're considered like slaves, like they're in doubt? The truth is we're both. There's a pasuk that says, Banim atem la Hashem elokechem. You are children of Hashem your God. And it also says, Ki li b'nei Yisrael avadim. We are Hashem's avadim. But if we are children, what does a slave have over a child that we want to be treated like slaves to? Seemingly a child has everything. What's a child? You know what it means, a child? Rabbi Lugasi told over, he said, I was once on a line 
trying to get in to see a great gadol. Gadol hador. And they will wait the long line. And uh, people were getting impatient, but that's what you have to do. You're lucky if you get in. And if you get in, you get three seconds. So they're all waiting. All of a sudden, somebody comes in, and they're walking someone in. He cuts the whole line. And everything just stops. And they say, what's going on over here? What's going on? They say, shh, that's the rabbi's son. Oh, the rabbi's son. And the rabbi's son goes in, and he just starts talking and talking and talking. The rabbi's son doesn't wait on lines, and the rabbi's son doesn't have a limit of time. We are banim la Hashem. We don't have to wait on a line to talk to him, and we don't have any limits. The more the better. Hashem has his ear kaviyachol for everybody, and he loves listening. But in what aspect are we considered like slaves? So a parent, the, the older the child gets, the more independent the parent wants the child to be. Once the child is able to walk on his own, the parent says, I don't want to carry you anymore. Now you have to walk. The child's able to get to school on his own. I'm not driving you anymore. You have to go yourself. And the older the child gets, the more independent. And if the child becomes fully independent, the parent's the happiest. You're on your own. What if a child is married and he comes back, I need money, give me this, give me that. Parents, listen, you're married now. You got to fend for yourself. That's the attitude of a parent to a child. But when it comes to Hashem, Hashem says, I want you to rely on me when you're 10, when you're 20, when you're 50, when you're 60, when you're 80. I want you to tell me, Hashem, I can't move without you. I can't walk one block. Please help me. I can't breathe. I need your help. Our eyes are on you. We need you. We're like slaves to their master. We have no independence. We need you for everything. Hashem loves us much more than a parent could ever love a child. It says, He wants us to cling to Him and never let go. Imagine a child, you know, a, a child runs to his father. Dad, carry me. Okay, I'll carry you. He's holding the, holding the child. After a few minutes, he puts the child down. Child, carry me more. There's only a certain amount of time. The parent, okay, I have to put you down. Hashem says, cling to me, never let go. I want to carry you forever. Hashem called us Banim. Beni Bechori Yisrael, when we were on the 49th level of Tum'ah in Egypt, He called us Beni Bechori Yisrael. No matter, for, He can't get worse than the 49th level of Tum'ah. Hashem wants everybody back. There was a story of a great rabbi, Rabbi Yosef Palak. Rabbi Yosef Palak, he used to give a shiur every night in Tel Aviv to a, bunch, to a group of boys. They used to learn Gemara every night. And the rabbi was so makpid to never miss a class. He put it in them. We can never miss Sunday night through Thursday night. Never miss. But one night, it was such bad weather. It was, nobody was on the streets. Nobody came to the class. The rabbi's there alone. The rabbi said, I can't miss. We can't have one night without Torah. He goes outside. He says, I'll try to get somebody. Goes into a store. There's nobody there. He says, Hashem, please, please help me. I don't want to miss a night of the class. And he starts walking, and he sees a house behind some trees. He gets close to the door. He sees a mezuzah. Okay, perfect. He knocks on the door. Someone opens the door. He looks inside. The person is clearly not religious. It smells, it's dirty, it's disgusting. The rabbi says in a nice demeanor, would you like to learn Gemara with me tonight? You want to learn some Torah? The man tells him, who sent you here? Says, Nobody sent me. I can't. He started to cry. He says, I can't believe you're here. 
please come inside. Comes inside the rabbi. He said, let me explain. He said, I survived the Holocaust. I was the only survivor from my family. Everybody was wiped out. I was left with nothing. I was so depressed. I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get anything. And I've been in this house alone, depressed for years. And I got to the point where I said, enough is enough. And he pointed to the ceiling, and there was a rope dangling. He said, Rabbi, tonight I was going to put an end to my misery. But before I did, I looked up to God and I said, God in heaven, if you are really here and you want me, tell me you want me and I'll come back. Rabbi, since the day I moved into this house, nobody ever knocked on my door. And tonight, right after I finished my prayer, you came knocking. Rabbi, I want to learn. Of course I want to learn. I want to come back. And this man, when Rabbi Pollock passed away, this man came to the Shiva house and he told over the story. And by that time, he was fully religious. Hashem wants everybody back no matter how much they rebelled, no matter how bad they were, no matter how long it's been since they prayed. The prayer of that person who says, you know what, Hashem? I'm going to pray tonight. I'm going to pray now. I'm going to open up his Sidur. I couldn't do it for all these months. I'm going to do it now. Hashem can't wait to listen. Teshuvah is so easy. Lo bashamayim hi, lo me'ever layam hi. Rav Itzel Petterberger said, you could have two people doing the exact same sin. And afterwards, one of them says, ah, shouldn't have done that. He feels a little groan, a little sorrow. He says, he is night and day from the other person. He's a world apart in heaven from a little sorrow, a little groan. Everyone on their own level has to make some type of teshuvah. We can't walk into Rosh Hashanah, the same people. You have to come in and understand there's a judgment and I have to change. But it doesn't have to be drastic. Sometimes we get confused. I heard Rabbi Zamir Kohen, he told the following story. He said someone told him that there's a man in Israel who refuses to put on tefillin because he smokes on Shabbat. And he said, how could the hand that smokes a cigarette on Shabbat put on tefillin? I'm a hypocrite if I do that. So he doesn't put on tefillin. He said, Rabbi, could you talk to him? The rabbi said, sure. The rabbi spoke to him. And he said the man was so pure. He really felt... It's not proper. I feel bad putting on tefillin because I do that. The rabbi told him, if you lose a hundred dollars, should you throw away a thousand? Everything. Each mitzvah is its own jewel in its own right. Don't throw away other mitzvot because you do one sin. And he convinced him to put on tefillin. He said, okay, rabbi, you convinced me. I'm going to put on tefillin. And then he told him, he said, so you smoke on Shabbat? You know how severe Shabbat? He said, Rabbi, I know Shabbat. I can't stop smoking. He smokes two packs a day. It's basically about 40 cigarettes a day he's smoking. The rabbi told him, he said, what about the rest of the day? Could you keep the rest of Shabbat? He says, yeah, I don't go to work. Technically, I could, but once I'm... Once I'm, not, once I'm smoking, I figure I, I use the phone, I turn on the lights. He says, no, I want you to keep the rest of Shabbat, turn your phone off, keep the lights on, everything you'll keep except smoking. He says, okay, I could do that. Then he tells him, he says, you know what? On Shabbat, your lungs need a little break. 40 cigarettes a day, they're becoming black. Give, your, give a little air, give a little break to your lungs on Shabbat. Smoke a little less. Could you do that? Yeah, I could do that. He says, how do you light the cigarette? 
He says, I take a lighter and I light it. He says, each time you do that, it's de Oraita, lighting a match. Do me a favor, light a 24 hour candle, put it on your counter. Every time you want a cigarette, you light it from the 24 hour candle. He said, no problem. And he started keeping Shabbat like that. He was doing everything except the smoke. And slowly he started learning and going to shul. And today he is fully religious. He stopped completely. Because the Yetzir Hara tells us, it's all or nothing. You're a hypocrite. You're doing this, you, you can't pray now. You're doing this. That's the ploys of the evil inclination. Don't listen to him. It's not all or nothing. Each mitzvah is its own jewel. If you're not doing this one, don't. and if you, you can't improve fully, you improve partially. This year, I'm improving on Shabbat. I'm going to be better in many areas. Not all, I can't yet. This is also teshuvah. And if a person can make teshuvah out of love to Hashem, all of his mitzvot, all of his averot turn into mitzvot. It's a golden opportunity. All the averot can turn into mitzvot. How do we make teshuvah of love? It's not so hard. Teshuvah of love means, Hashem, you do so much for me. You're so kind. You're so great. You're so awesome. I feel bad. Not because I'm scared of punishment. I feel bad that I'm letting you down. I feel bad I'm not living up to my, my, what I'm supposed to. You're so great. If we would contemplate the greatness of Hashem, you know, it's unbelievable. Hashem is running the lives of every single person in the world, billions and billions of people. He's setting up second to second with their nisyonot, in their situations, exactly what they need to hear, what they need to see, what they don't see, who they have to meet, what. And at the same time, he's doing everyone, and he's still running the world at the same time with every single individual having to live together in the world. And the Hashgaha Peratid is mind boggling. I read a story, there was an organization called, there is an organization called Elef Hamagen an organization in Israel who sends out rabbis around the world to go and help communities, re-energize, start communities. And in their beginning, I think it was the late 70s, they sent out an English-speaking rabbi from Israel to the Bronx here in New York to help out with a dying community, an older community that really had no life to it. And they informed the community, we're sending you a rabbi. They picked him up from the airport, a few old men, and they brought him to the shul. They said, Rabbi, this is our shul. They look at the rabbi, walks in. He's very disheartened. There's cobwebs, there's dust piled up, the chairs are rusty. It doesn't look like an inviting place. They haven't used the shul in who knows how long. But the rabbi was full of energy. The rabbi tells them, you know, in three months from today is Purim. We're going to fix this place up. We're going to put signs. We're going to advertise. We're going to have a grand reopening for Purim. It's going to be unbelievable. We're going to start the community fresh. And the rabbi went and he got some contractors and he got cleaners. And, and with two weeks left before Purim, the shul looked gorgeous, ready for opening. Then a blizzard hit New York. Everyone was homebound for two or three days. By the time you got out of your house, the rabbi went to the shul three days later, and he saw from the melting snow there was damage, water damage in one of the walls, and it looked horrible. The rabbi said, we're getting close, 10 days away from opening day. He calls up a painter, please fix this. The painter comes, it's too cold, it's not a good time to paint. You have to wait till the spring, another month. The rabbi, I have opening day in 10 days, please. Stop. No, I can't do it. I only do a good job. The rabbi is thinking, what should I do? The rabbi decides, he remembers, he saw out of the corner of his eye, there was a thrift shop in the area. 
said, maybe I'll go find the painting or something to cover up the, uh, to cover up the, uh, the, 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 the damage. He goes to the thrift shop, he's looking around. He sees a beautifully embroidered Magen David on a nice gold cloth. He says, wow, that's perfect. Put it right there. It was funny, there was on the bottom initials EBG. Didn't understand what that was. He said, it's perfect. How much is it? He buys it and he puts it in his car. He's going back to the shul, he's excited. On the way back to the shul, he notices an older Jewish woman. She just missed the bus. He feels bad, he rolls down his window. Excuse me, miss, uh, where are you headed? Uh, I'm headed to New Jersey. New Jersey is an hour and a half away. He was gonna take her. He said, oh, when's the next bus? Two hours. Two hours, it's freezing outside. You can't wait out here for two hours. He says, you know, we're, we have a grand reopening of the shul. The shul is open now. Why don't you come sit in the shul? You'll get a cup of tea and you'll catch the next bus. Thank you very much, Rabbi. She goes in the car. He brings it to the shul and he gets a ladder. He's putting up, he starts putting up the, uh, the Magen David. This older woman's looking, he's watching him. All of a sudden she cries out in hysteria. Where did you get that from? She's crying, what are you, what? I got it from the, th that's mine. It's yours. I made that for my husband and I gave it to him over 35 years ago in the war and I haven't seen him since. He says, oh, I feel so bad. I just got it from the thrift shop. Here, it's yours, take it. She says, no, what am I gonna do with it? Better let the shul use it. He felt so bad. He said, you know what, let me drive you home. And he drove her all the way back to her house in New Jersey. Comes back to the Bronx and Purim comes around. It's a joyous day. The shul looks beautiful. The people are excited. The rabbi's excited. They come in. The rabbi says, we're gonna, we're gonna get ready to read the Megillah in a few minutes. All of a sudden, there's an old man in the front and he's sobbing loud. The rabbi goes over to the old man. Everything okay? And he's pointing. That Magen David, that's mine. What? The rabbi almost fainted. He said, my wife gave that to me 35 years ago and the Nazis took it from me. And I haven't seen her since. The rabbi was speechless. He said, please, we're gonna read the Megillah and then I'm gonna tell you something afterwards. They read the Megillah, he, he said, come with me. He knows where the lady's house is. He drives him to New Jersey and he goes in and he tells her, I have a surprise for you. He breaks it to her slowly. The door opens, she sees her husband. She says, Moshe! And he says, Bella! And they start crying. After 35 years, I don't know why they had to be separated from all that time. But the hashkaha, when Hashem wanted to bring them back together, was amazing. How the rabbi has to come in from Israel. He's revitalizing the shul. And then all of a sudden, a blizzard hits, water damage. He sees the thrift shop. He goes and gets it. And that second that he's on his way back, he sees a lady from New Jersey who misses her bus in the Bronx and he brings her to the shul and she sees the curtain and, and he finds out where she lives and he drives her. It's mind boggling how many things have to happen. And all this is going on, it's just one small piece. The blizzard had to happen for a hundred other reasons and the rabbi had to be there for other reasons. And he's inside of a bigger picture, there's a million smaller pictures that Hashem is running every single day. It's amazing. And this is the Hashem who loves us so much, who's interested in us. And He tells us, I beg you, please do the mitzvot for your sake, letov lach. We should feel embarrassed. I'm ashamed, Hashem. I'm ashamed. I feel bad that I'm not living up to my potential. That is great teshuvah. People who have problems, long problems. You know, they come every year on Rosh Hashanah and they say, 
maybe this year is gonna be different. Maybe things are gonna change for me. Maybe I'm gonna get married this year. Maybe I'm gonna have a child this year. And they hope and they pray and they go through it. And then they're let down. And again, they're let down and again. And they come now and they say, why should I expect anything to be different this year than last year or the year before? First of all, we are not the same people that we are now that we were a year before. We changed, our situations have changed. And number two, whatever happened the last year, the year before, the year before, has absolutely nothing to do with this year. The job of a Jew is to accept and hope. Accept and hope. Accept that whatever happened till today is because Hashem knew with His great wisdom that this is what my soul needed for me to do my purpose in the world. And if that's what was needed, then so be it. I accept with love, Hashem. But it says nothing about a minute from now. It says nothing about tomorrow. And tomorrow, it could be that my mission is to get what I want. And therefore, we hope and pray always that now will be different. It doesn't matter. You no, know, people think there's a gezera on me, maybe. There's something, whole, something over my head that I can't break. Maybe I need to go to a mikubal. Maybe he's going to do some type of trick on me. Maybe he'll do some. There's no such thing as a gezera that can't be broken by you. Let me read you a famous story in the Navi. It's in Melachim Bet Perek Chaf. It says, Bayamim Hahem Hala Chizkiyahu Lamut. Chizkiyahu HaMelech, at the young age of 39, was dying. And came to him Yeshayahu ben Amotz, the prophet, and he told him, Ko Amar Hashem. So says Hashem, Sav Lebetecha, write your will. Ki met ata velo because you're dying and you're not going to live. You're dying in this world, you're not going to live in the next world. He got a gezera stamped from Hashem through the mouth of the prophet. It can't get any worse than that. And Chizkiyahu was such a righteous king. The, the people knew so much Torah in his days. He asked Yeshayahu, what did I do? Yeshayahu said, you didn't have children. You didn't try to get married. He said, oh, that's because I saw in Ruach HaKodesh that my children would be the Shaim. He said, that's not your business. You have to do what you have to do. That's in Hashem's hands. He says, I'm sorry. Give me your daughter right now in marriage. Maybe through my zechut and your zechut we'll be able to have a righteous child. And Yeshayahu tells him, didn't you hear what I said? The Gezera is finished. It's signed and sealed. You're done. The words, much worse than any doctor could ever say. The words of a Navi. And listen to Chizkiyahu's response. He tells him, are you finished? Kale nebu'atecha b'tzeh. Okay, I don't need to talk to you anymore. Kach mekublani mi bet avi abba. I have a tradition from my grandfather, David Amelech. Even if there's a sword, a sharp sword on someone's neck and someone's trying to kill him, it's not over. It's never over. And it says, He turned to the wall. And the Gemara says, He prayed from the depths of his heart. Vayeb Chizkiyahu Bechi Gadol. And he cried a great cry. Yeshayahu the Pasuk says, Lo Yasa Haser Atichona. He didn't even leave the courtyard of the palace. Udvar Hashem Hayah Elav Lemor. 
And Hashem called him and he said, Shuv, ve'amartal chizkiyahu negid ami. Go back and tell Chizkiyahu the king. Ko amar Hashem, shamati a tefilatecha. I heard your prayers. Ra'iti a dimatecha. I saw your tears. I'm going to heal you. And he added 15 years to his life. That means with one prayer, one heartfelt prayer, broke a gezerah that was stamped by Hashem from, through a prophet. That means nothing is ever beyond impossible. Everything could change. I would like to conclude with a powerful story that will give us chizuk. Tremendous chizuk for the upcoming days of Rosh Hashanah. The story was told over by a rabbi, Menachem Stein Shalita. It didn't, didn't say when it took place. Could be 10 years ago, 20, 30, I don't know. The rabbi said he knew a person named Daniel who lived in Petach Tikva. And this Daniel had excruciating lower back pain that just kept bothering him and bothering him. For 12 years, he couldn't shake it. He went to doctors in Israel. He went to doctors in America. Everywhere you could go, nobody could help him. He took this medication called Voltaren, which was helpful to the back, but potentially damaging to the liver. But he had no choice. He needed it. And he was on this medication for six years. His life was not a life. He couldn't sit in a chair for more than 15 minutes at a time. The pain would shoot up his spine, go to his neck, and force him to lie down. He couldn't be a good father. He had one child. He couldn't learn with him. His wife, he couldn't be a good husband to. He was depressed. He couldn't hold a job. And Rabbi Stein went over to him one year. He saw how broken he was. And he said, Daniel, listen to me. Rosh Hashanah is coming in a couple of weeks. Do you know that on Rosh Hashanah, Hashem is going to recreate the world anew. There's going to be a new start to the world every year on Rosh Hashanah. He says, do you know Hashem is going to recreate people. Every person is going to get new life on Rosh Hashanah to the point that there's a halakha. If you didn't see a friend in over a year and then you see them, you make a beracha with Hashem's name, Mehaye Hametim. Haye Hametim? He didn't die. Because the rabbi say, Chafetz Chaim rings down from the Maharsha because he went through a Rosh Hashanah and he was given new life. It was like he was brought back from the dead. He said, do you know Daniel? On Rosh Hashanah, we read about Sarah, Imenu, and Chana having children. Don't you think on Rosh Hashanah, we should read something more apropos to the day? Maybe we should read about the judgment. Why do we read about Sarah and Hana? He says, you know why? You know what Sarah was told by the doctors? You're an old woman. Chazal tell us she didn't even have a bet rechem. She couldn't have children. She didn't have a womb. The doctor told her, it's impossible. Stop giving, you better give up hope already. But on one Rosh Hashanah, through the tefillot of Sarah, Nifkeda, she was remembered, and Hashem created her anew with a womb, and she had a baby, 90 years old, and so to Chana, and so to Rachel, and on Rosh Hashanah, we are all created anew. Anybody can get a new lease on anything. People have trouble in work. You could have a new parnasah, a new bill of health. Daniel, Hashem could create you with a new back. This Rosh Hashanah, Daniel was inspired. He said, thank you, Rabbi. And he accepted upon himself that year 
to have a ta'anit dibur, 48 hours on Rosh Hashanah, no talking other than Torah and tefillah. And he went in so serious, and he accepted upon himself to become better. And then he went through Aseret Yemei Teshuvah, crying and begging, Yom Kippur. He went through Sukkot, Simchat Torah, and the holidays passed. And Cheshvan came around, and then Dalid Cheshvan. He ran out of his medication. You get it in three-month increments, and you have to go back each time to get a new prescription. See, he goes to the doctor on Dalid Cheshvan, and as fate would have it, his doctor wasn't there that day. He sent a replacement, a young, rookie, 29-year-old doctor fresh out of medical school. Could be his first appointment. Daniel says to himself, what is this guy over here? I don't have time for this nonsense. I need to get my, pre all right, it's just a prescription. He says, uh, I'm here to get my prescription for Voltaren. I have lower back pain. The doctor knows everything. Voltaren? That's a dangerous medication. Don't worry, I know what it is. Please. I don't think, how long? Three months? That's too long. He says, listen, doctor, I'm taking it for six years already. It's already been approved by the doctor. Just please give me the, give me the, give me the prescription. He says, did you ever check your kidneys? My kidneys? I told you I have a back problem. Why would I check my kidney? You know, the kidneys are connected to the back. I think you should get an ultrasound on your kidneys. He's going to walk out. He said, I've been to every doctor in the world who's an expert in the back. Nobody told me about my kidneys. Just give me the prescription. He says, no, I want you to get an ultrasound. He says, OK. He goes upstairs. He goes to the, get an ultrasound on his kidneys. The results come back. One of his kidneys is 22% blocked. They tell the doctor. They call up his real doctor. They said his kid, he said, I can't believe it. That's it. That's the problem. I never thought of that. And neither did any doctor in the world think of that. And the reason is because Hashem didn't put it in their brain because it wasn't time to him to be healed. But now on this Rosh Hashanah, when he prayed with such emunah, he broke the Gezerah. It was time to be healed. And Hashem sent the Rifu'ah in such an obvious way that it was Him through a rookie doctor. So we know it was Hashem. And this is what Hashem could do for everybody. No matter what you're going through, on Rosh Hashanah, we can be created anew. Be'ezrat Hashem, we utilize these days with seriousness. We accept upon ourselves to become better. And Be'ezrat Hashem, Hashem should shower you all with Beracha, with Parnasa, with Biriut, with Kol Meshalot Lebechem Letova. Amen.